I did say Aaron. Okay, good. I was just making sure. Yeah, hi, I'm Aaron Sams. Uh, I uh, do a lot of things. I was a former high school chemistry teacher. I travel a lot now talking about the flipped classroom concept. I uh, have a book out on it. Got number two coming out this summer. And, uh, yeah, I met Chris a couple years ago um, at my conference, so I think it was there. Anyhow, uh, and I was just, yeah, happy to share my stories, and that's pretty much all I know because I'm not a researcher. I don't know a heck of a lot, but I have a lot of classroom stories to tell. Awesome. Thanks. Daniel, go. Oh, hi. How are you? So I'm Dan Welty from uh, near Boston in Massachusetts. Uh, this is my first year flipping. Um, I'm just over halfway through, and uh, I teach physics, and uh, things are going great. I'm in a one-to-one -one iPad setting in my own classroom and paperless as well. Awesome. Carl, hook us up. Uh, my name is Carl Lindgren Stryker. Um, similar to Aaron, I met Chris at FlipCon in Chicago uh, about a year and a half ago. Um, I am a world history teacher, ninth and 10th grade world history teacher, um, about a half hour south of San Francisco in California, and um, I have, I'm in a one-to-one -one Chromebook setting. Last and definitely not least. Hello, I recognize many faces in the room already. Patrick Dempsey, eighth grade over at Hickson. Um, my experience with flip teaching, I I, I did it for about a year and a half um, and mandated that you know students go home and, and watch the video. I still have the videos and um, it's just not, uh, I've found it's not the tool for absolutely everyone. Right on. Okay, we've got uh, Rob Lamb is joining us and as soon as I see his face, I will have him introduce ourselves uh, or introduce himself. Uh, there you are. I heard your voice. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go. Yeah, you're going to lose face on this one. I'm, uh, we're having internet issues at school, so I'm on my cell phone, and I'm not about to try to uh, use video on that. So trust me, I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> Outstanding, Rob. Outstanding. Uh, Rob, Rob we're a mad we're, scientist, so that picture suits him well. Right. Thank you. Rob, yeah. where do you teach? I teach at Pattonville High School in St. Louis, Missouri. And uh, what devices do your kiddos have? They all have MacBook Airs, and uh, that's nice. We like those. <laughs> uh, we also have Promethean boards in every classroom, and uh, and we're very lucky. We spend our money. We spend our money where we want to, but we avoid like all of our back end stuff as far as you know what the kids interface with, you know, move all that stuff is free source. So we, we try to avoid using expensive programs, we just buy expensive stuff. <laughs> all right, sounds good. All right. So we've got uh, the top four questions that we're making sure that we have to get through because those are the burning questions, and then we have about you know ridiculous amount more that we'll do the best we can to get through. Um, so the number one question, the most important question is, what happens when students don't watch the video and they come to class completely unprepared? So handle it, boys. Well, this just happened to me uh, on Monday. I was giving, uh, we were doing an activity and students, four or five students did not watch the video. So I was able to have them go right on the iPads. I sat them together in their own groups and they had to watch the video and once they had done that and submitted the Google form on it, then they could start in on the activity. So that way they didn't—they weren't in a group where they were going to hold up their group um, to kind of go forward. Um, to me, like the video, the video is one tool to get that information. And so if there is another way that I can have students get that information and. Um, then I will I will use whatever whatever that is. I mean, could could flip teaching be done with an article? Could flip teaching be done with a textbook? I mean, it's it's really about kids getting the information on their own because we're not always going to be here, and then coming into class and, and using that information. So if kids don't have the video, they still need to get the important information. Yeah, I totally agree with Patrick. Uh, for, I fought this for a year and about a year and a half, and I finally said, "Why am I requiring all my students to do this 
um, if this is not the best way for them to learn. So I, I ultimately, uh, over the course of many years, my, my video instructions were part of the menu of learning. You could, you could uh, you know, just Google the learning objective. You could watch the video. Here's the section of the textbook you could read. Here's some problem sets you could do. I don't care how you learn it. I just want you to learn it, and then your job is now to demonstrate your understanding on that particular topic. Yeah, I mean, yeah. like, what I found was the, the video doesn't work for everyone. Some kids really want to read the information. Um, and I actually haven't created any instructional videos this year. Um, I've I've kind of moved away from broad content demonstration of knowledge um, and let kids dive into aspects of a unit that they're really interested in. So they get some time to kind of build some schema about a unit and then choose an area that interests them and dive right in. So um, it, it's really in. <laughs> When Chris was like, "Hey, I'm looking for people," I was like, "Hey, I'm happy to talk," but it's a, it's a weird version of flip class. Um, and uh, yeah, it's it's more about getting kids to access the parts of history that they're interested in, and me not me. The, uh, yeah, I'm just I'm I'm there to help, but I'm not there to create um, content videos for them. Very cool. Hey, Stacy, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Hi, Stacy. How you doing? Introduce yourself. Hi. To I'm doing well. All right, will you tell us uh, what you teach and where you're at? I teach um, math. I teach this year at Honors Algebra 2 and AP Calculus, and I'm in Potomac, Maryland, outside of D.C. at um, a private school. Fantastic. Thank you, Stacey. Um, we're just going through the uh, questions. The first one is, what happens when your students don't watch the video? So I didn't know if you wanted to chime in before I move on to the next question. Sure. Um, you know what? I'm teaching all honors and AP classes right now, and I'm not you don't having. Have this problem. Okay. Next question. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm not having that much of a problem, um, but I do have kids who don't watch them. They they do have to watch it like before class starts. We have uh, one to one, so the kids watch them before, and they just don't like that because they want to work together and work in class and stuff. So it's a pretty good, you know, incentive for honors. <laughs> Thanks, Stacey. Uh, guys, anything else to come around and, and uh, end that question? Um, or if the room wanted to follow up on any of that? I mean, I think that, I think that Stacey's point is a really important one. Uh, if, oh, go ahead. <laughs> go ahead, Rob. That's what happens what? when you're on the phone. All right. Um, I, I think that Stacy's point is a really important one. That um, if if you're going to expect kids. Oh, to okay, my turn. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Chris, do you want me to talk or not? I, I don't know what to do. <laughs> right. <laughs> Carl, go ahead, and then I'll then we'll get uh, get Rob. Um, I, I think that, uh, in, in um, I, I think Dan alluded to this as well. That if you're going to ask kids to do stuff outside of class, that you need to make, uh, you need to give them an incentive by having your class time be really, really awesome um, to go out and, and and be willing to do that work outside of class. And you know, if you if you're teaching kids who are in AP Calculus, like Stacy teaches, hey, awesome, they're going to go do the work. But um, you know, anybody, if you're if you're doing awesome stuff in class, kids want to do that. They don't want to go watch the video. So I think that that's that that, that her point is a really important one. All right, Rob, you got anything? All right, then we'll move on to the next question, which is um, what happens and how do you serve kids that don't have access to the Internet at home um, or the ability to watch a video at home? So what are your, some of your solutions? This is the number one question I get asked. Uh, I'm, hands down more than any other question. It, my answer to that is just it's it's a legitimate question. You absolutely have to provide access, but don't let this stop you. Just per, find a way. I mean, make it happen. So if you are requiring the students to watch video, yes, you need to provide them with a resource. I gave flash drives burned on DVDs. I had a uh, I was able to get some iPod touches with a grant and I was able to check them out to students. I used to build computers like I would get old computers from that were garbage, rebuild them and give them away to students. Do what you need to do, or the option, uh, like what Patrick was just talking about, don't require it. Give them other opportunities to figure out how they're going to learn best. 
video might be best for a person, and uh, then they're going to have some choice and a little bit of autonomy in the situation as well, and they're going to be more inclined to, to buy in and learn. Yeah, I, th I think you really just have to, you have to think in both of these questions that we've had so far, you have to think about what is the goal? What is the goal? Is the goal for students to get information on their own? And if, if that is your goal, then how many different ways can they do that? Um, I think, you know, a lot of a lot of stuff on flip teaching, people say it's not about the video, but then they spend hours talking about the video. You know, um, the, the concept is really kids learning on their own and then coming into class and using that knowledge and using that understanding. Anybody else got a, a, a chime in? Okay, anybody in the room want to follow up? No? You guys get Christmas. to look at my... Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, I was going to say something and I forgot I muted myself. Um, I just don't assign videos and I don't believe in homework, so that makes that whole thing a moot point. And I totally get, I mean, people who have, you know, content standards that they have to cover. I'm lucky that I can say that because I teach world history and people don't care about world history test scores, and I totally understand that that's not the reality for everybody, but it's my reality, so I try to take advantage of it. That's a good... I'm going to go ahead and throw that out. I'm going to follow up with you, Carl, and say... Can you do a flipped teaching model without assigning homework? Go. I mean, do you, what, it, how are you defining flipped teaching? I'm oh, going to throw it back to you. Go. Right. No! <laughs> you're my panel of experts. So, um, so I'm throwing it back to you guys to see what you guys think. So I, I totally think you can. Um, I think that, it, for me, flip teaching in... <laughs> I can't believe I'm going to say this in front of Aaron Sams, who can, <laughs> was welcome to tell me that I'm an idiot and I've totally <laughs> taken his idea. Now he's making a funny face at me. But um, <laughs> for me, flip teaching is about um, making the best use of your face-to-face -face time. It's about focusing on higher-order thinking skills, and it's about maximizing student voice and student choice. And I think that there's no reason that you need to assign homework or create instructional videos to do that thing. I also understand that that's not um, a that that's not what the the public has defined flip teaching as, and so there aren't necessarily people that there there aren't necessarily or not everybody's going to necessarily agree with that definition. I'll also say that I used videos in when I was teaching algebra one to ninth graders, and um, I did not assign that as homework. I did not give them very much homework because just the quality of homework wasn't very good. And so making maximizing class time was our best in our best interest. And so I had the kids watch videos in the class, but it was an opportunity. They didn't all have to watch it at the same time. It was an opportunity for me to like do individual work, maybe meet one on one with a student while the rest of the class was really engaged in something. Um, and so I think there's a lot of different uses of video and what it's for. Also, I used it as an opportunity to watch some students take notes who are having a really hard time taking notes. Um, I could watch them watch the video, how they watched a lecture, how they processed it, and stuff like that. So, you know, I think those little things, too, it doesn't have to go home for homework um, making a video, so. Yep. Chris, can I, can I share my screen for just a second? Please do. Okay. Um, so my my uh, my group that I do a lot of this stuff with, uh, Flip Learning Network, we're working on a definition. We've been very reluctant to pin down a definition, but we're going to be publishing this uh, very very soon. So uh, I'm going to give you a sneak peek. Um, can you see that right now? Hold on. If I stop talking, yes. Okay. So here's the here's the definition basically that we've come up with. Um, the idea is that you're just moving direct instruction in, out of the groups in the learning space into an individual learning space. So th whatever that means, that might be a video, that might be some other direct teaching method, mean, you know, from text, that might be from other something else, but you're, you're putting that the, uh, uh, the you're just putting that on the individual learner instead of doing that in a group, and then you're you're taking the the, the recuperated uh, the time and learning space back. Uh, uh, that you've kind of recuperated and giving that back to the group and doing better things with that. So, um, Aaron, you share your screen again. It 
went back to you, which you're going to look at. But okay, now I know about that. Um, <laughs> yeah. Let's see. Screen share. So there you go. I'll, can you see it yeah. now? Perfect. Okay, so I'll put that up there. Um, so I mean, great. I mean, th this is really nothing new. The the definition that we've kind of come up with, but we look at it and we're like, this is just kind of good teaching. Um, so I really, to be honest, I wish the word would go away. Uh, let's call it being a good teacher and not putting things in pigeonholes or whatever. Now, I think video is a very powerful teaching tool, and that's why I continue to use it, and that's why I continue to talk about it. But if you, if you can give some autonomy to your students, if you can, as a teacher, stop talking for a while and uh, give some of the control and some of the power of learning back to students, and then um, and just make your, your, your class uh, an environment in which that can happen, then that's great and go for it. So the idea then, so let's say you do choose to use video because it, it's great and it's awesome and I love it. Do you have to give it at home? Who cares? Give it to the student to do when they need to do it. Uh, I moved to an asynchronous classroom and my students did things uh, on their own time when they were ready for it. Uh, sometimes I was in class, sometimes I was on a bus, sometimes I was at lunch, and sometimes I was at home. It just really depended on what the individual learner needed. And I will stop talking because I've been talking for too long. That was great. Um, anybody else want to chime in, or we'll go on to our next question? Yeah, go ahead. The, I have two things for the panel. Uh, number one, you guys are, are talking about um, note-taking and other skills that where you don't necessarily teach. Are, do you expect the students to come in with that knowledge of uh, no, being able to take notes from watching a video like Stacy mentioned, or do you find yourself having to teach those skills? I, I'm going to venture. I'm to venture guess that every single person on this panel teaches those skills. I, th I mean, I think I I feel like a broken record, but you you have to come back to the goal. Is the goal note taking? Is the goal your content? Um, and if if note taking is important to you, and that's the vehicle that you're going to deliver your, your content through, then then absolutely you you should teach it. Okay. The other thing I I wanted to to uh, point out to your your panel. When you see us, you're looking, not me, but you're looking at quite a few elementary teachers in here. Um, how, how do you address them with some of the, some of the things you've been talking about? Yeah, I mean, I, I like all of you guys, but I, I didn't, didn't get an elementary school teacher on the panel, and I was, I was trying for a couple of weeks to make that happen. Uh, one part of my job is that I, uh, I su supervise a few student teachers for a local college here, and I was in a sixth grade math, math, sixth grade math classroom this morning observing a student teacher in a flipped classroom. So he had instructional content that he posted, very short video, four minutes I think it was, that students watched last night. It was posted their uh, class ed moto page. Um, there were a few kids who showed up and hadn't watched it, and he had other students doing something. He had those kids doing it, and then the they just segued right into uh, actively using what they had done. They, they had some guided notes, kind of a fill-in-the-blank type of thing, so maybe a little more structure like that for younger students instead of saying, you know, here's some blank paper, jot some stuff down. Um, it was a very structured lesson, really walked them through it, and then they were, they blew me away. It was what they were actually capable of doing when they, right, just right when they got in the door today. And a lot of um, multiple subject teachers, Chris, um, like will flip one subject or flip a couple subjects. So like, I mean, I know that Delia Bush, a buddy of mine from Michigan, um, she flips just math. And I think and she team teaches and teaches like, I'm going to make up the second subject, but she teaches math and something else to two classes. And so she flips her math instruction um, and then does more traditional instruction, uh, I believe, in the other subject that she teaches to this kind of shared set of kids. Mm -hmm. We like accidentally kind of did this today and not really planned. Um, we're in the process of revising and editing for a publishing piece next week, and I teach third grade, by the way. And three kids in our classroom are ready to publish, and the rest were not. So I made a video about how they were going to publish. And I said, get on your drive and go to this and watch it. And then they watched it at the back table. Um, and started publishing, and Michelle and I never actually 
had to walk over and talk to them about publishing. They just watched the video and did it. And then we taught were, the lesson. And then they were able then to, because we were conferring with students. So as we were conferring and kids were ready to publish, we would say, oh, hey, whoever, would you mind teaching this student how you got on? I mean, you showed them how to get on to watch the video. I mean, that was the only instruction that was ever delivered. So after that, it was them, them teaching each other how to get on and watch it. So it was kind of, it was neat. It was, it was I, I think it's definitely doable in the elementary classroom as, as you two just, just showed us. And it's it's really the the idea that you all information does not need to come from a teacher talking or giving that information in the front of the room because information is so cheap. It's so cheap. It's just getting on a phone, it's getting on a device, it's opening a book. And so with because information is is just there, it's just out there. It's it's now you, the teacher, are the expert on w what sources are really good information, and has the kid really learned it? Um, that's that's where your expertise kicks in. I think one of the best things that I've seen with my uh, students over the year now is seeing them help each other, like uh, Patrick just said. And uh, if a student has a question, I really try to refrain and, and kind of listen in because I'm more excited to hear what they talk about. And I think that's one new thing for me this year is I'm not telling and answering every question that every kid has. They're really answering each other's questions. And that's been the, one of the most exciting things. OK, we have a, a question. The next one is, uh, where did you, if you made a video, where did you put it? Uh, I know mine all went to about three or four different areas, but where did you put yours? Everywhere. That's the short answer. Um, but I don't recommend that. I recommend you pick one method that you are comfortable with and that all of your students can access, and you do that. Uh, YouTube is familiar. Uh, there's YouTube for schools now, uh, if, you're, if your IT department is skittish about that. Um, that's that's low-hanging fruit. It's familiar. Um, uh, that's probably the easiest place to put most of that kind of stuff. Yeah, my videos are on YouTube as well, uh, simply out of the reason that I learned last year that uh, some uh, places to put them, students couldn't access them. So this way they can access it on an iPhone, on an iPad, on a laptop computer, all, all those devices they can get on the YouTube. Um, I've done the videos on Google Drive uh, because it's not blocked by the school filters at all. I don't have to mess with that, and it's it's easy to download from Drive and put it on a thumb drive or anything else. I've also put them on YouTube just because that is that's what kids know. I put them, I use Camtasia Studio to make my videos, and so I put them right to screencast.com only because I put some interactive elements in it, and that's the only way that I can keep that those elements. Um, but it's really easy for me because our school has a learning management system, so I just embed the videos there, and then it's just super simple. So. Hey, Rob, now that you're home, good to see you, buddy. Well, we had to try that. I was having Google administration errors. I don't even know how I get one of those. Well, awesome. Um, so it's, I ran home. That's good. Well, awesome. Hey, um, tell people where you post your videos. Okay, we actually do a lot. We do it all internally. We have uh, we use a, a free program um, that's called Clip Bucket. Uh, that uh, the code's free. You can go out and find it online, and that we host on a server inside the building. Uh, I've also used in the past, I use uh, a wiki that's built in that has a blog, a video blog. And all of those uh, create um, playlists that can be, or podcasts that can be downloaded by iTunes directly onto the computers. So all I have to do is make the podcast up. Once they download it once, every time I add anything new at all, it ends up uh, going directly to them within a couple seconds. So I never have to worry about them getting my stuff. It shows up whether they like it or not. 
And they do that through uh, iTunes, right? They do that through iTunes, but honestly, it'll work with anything they can pull a podcast, it'll work with. So, you know, I've had Android devices and everything else pull my podcast down with no problem. Cool. I mean, I think, I think it's important to figure out what's not blocked, number one, and then number two, just to be consistent. As long as your kids know where to look, they'll go. Um, and, you know, if, if there's three places that you're consistently putting stuff, that's not a bad thing. But if you're going to put some on YouTube and some on Vimeo and some on Screencast, the kids aren't going to find it. So I think the, right. the consistency is important. Yeah, and Stacy mentioned... That. Sorry, go, Rob, go ahead. No, I said I totally agree with that. You know, you've got to have it all in one place and be standard on what you do. Yeah, and like what Stacy mentioned, using a learning management system, and that's that's huge. So even if you do have them, you know, thrown out all over the internet, you got stuff on Vimeo and YouTube and Screencast.com. If you just post a link in your learning management system, and students know all the stuff for class is there, they're just going to go. They're going to click on whatever's next, and it's going to be irrelevant where it goes out to as long as they, uh, as long as it's not blocked somewhere. So yeah, find a learning management system, use it, and just link to it from there. Yeah, and for our cases, sometimes some of us are using Edline as our learning management system. Some people are using Edmodo as their learning management system. Whatever works in your classroom, just you know, that is kind of the way to be consistent for us. Okay. Cool. Follow-up questions from the room. Anything you guys want to ask about that as we we're talking? Okay. All right. So uh, this is a really good question. I think this is the last essential question, uh, and then we can see what else we have on here. Is how frequently should you, could you, do you um, record videos or create content or make kids or ask kids to watch, uh, to prepare for class? Uh, well, my kids watch, uh, there's one video per week, and they're pretty excited about saying they only have homework once a week. Uh, and it's usually over the weekend, so it's due on a Monday. Um, I, I found since after making a lot of these now for half a year that about an 8 to 12 minute video covers about 40 or 50 minutes plus of a lecture because uh, I don't have to repeat myself. I don't have to have kids raising hands. Um, so they like that about it and that content will last me literally the entire week as far as what they're doing actively in the classroom and what they're creating. Uh, when I was mandating that every student watch the videos, it, it was one per week, and um, students would, yeah, they would watch them once a week. But now, since I'm not mandating that, it's more of a tool for kids when they're absent. It's a tool for kids when they need extra practice or when they didn't quite, you know, learn it in class or assessments show that they need review. So now it's more of an as-needed tool. Chris, have you talked about Ramsey Musalam at all yet? No, not yet. Okay. Uh, Ramsey's like one of the smartest guys I've ever met. Right, um, I, did, he, I did invite him, however, he's kind of busy, so... We'll yeah, find. yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, Ramsey talks a lot about um, having kids go out and play and explore and use that to surface misconceptions and demonstrate knowledge of content and then maybe some kids have been able to figure out everything from the, the exploration section he teaches chemistry um, but then other kids who you know have misconceptions or have knowledge gaps he's able to really quickly um, create uh, videos I think he uses edu creations um, to to you know make really fast really brief videos to, to fill in kind of those knowledge gaps that that kids have and then sends them back out you know modifies the task and sends them back out to have them kind of demonstrate the the mastery of knowledge in a novel way and I think that you know it's one of those things where you know if if it's something like Dan is talking about where you've got this you know week of of work that you can do with you know I don't know some wave length in physics, I'm making that up, Dan, don't, don't throw anything at me, um, then great, but, uh, you know, for, for Ramsey's sake, you know, it's like, hey, kids are doing it, here's a misconception, let me, let me correct that and then send you back out. So I think that there's, that there's more than one way to, to, to skin a cat there. Yeah, I think the, the question, you know, how often should you be making new content or how often should you be making videos is kind of like asking how often should I have tacos for dinner. Is, I mean, you're going to have tacos for dinner when it's, you've got the stuff in your fridge, you're hungry for tacos, and it's the right thing right then to have for dinner. So, I mean, don't do what I did. My mistake was that I made 100 chemistry videos, whether it was the best way to teach something or not. And then I came to find out that like 25% of my videos were getting no use because they were not the most appropriate tool to teach what I needed to teach. 
So I learned the hard way. I overmade content and then didn't use a big portion of it. So if video is going to be the best delivery tool for to learn something, use that. If if an inquiry uh, investigation is going to be the best way to learn a particular topic, do that. If reading some text is going to be the best way to learn something, do that. And you might come from trial and error. It might come from research. It might come from articles that you read. It's just we all as teachers. We reflect after a lesson and we go, wow, that was awesome, or man, that was crap. I need to have a beer right now or I'm going to quit. You know, And so it, we all go through those days and we all get to reflect, but uh, use a particular learning strategy when it's appropriate to do it. Yeah, or, and I'll just talk in, in the AP classroom. You know, I have two to three videos that I assign per week and I get through all of the material very comfortably that way, um, way more comfortably than I ever did before and um, that's two to three a week and so that's not that bad and I don't do any just direct lecture at the board. We do a lot of discussion at the board but it's very different than it used to be. It's not like the first time they're seeing it where they have no clue what's going on. It's much more about their questions um, and we reflect on whatever they had watched for you know during the lesson um, and get into like the deeper thoughts during class. Um, and so yeah I think that's again this is AP that's pretty fast paced and I have no trouble getting through my curriculum anymore and you know we've had a bunch of snow days this year and I'm not even nervous about it right now and so that to me is the biggest thing about the flip classroom for me is just how comfortably I can get through the material now. And, and that's a great point you know last week with the snow day we were supposed to have a test the next day we were supposed to go to the review the day before and uh, and I threw out a Remind 101 and said I shot up the video of the me talking about the review. Send me any questions you've got through the Moodle, and uh, and we're still doing this tomorrow. Sorry, and and we did it, and they did fine. They 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 didn't seem to be too phased by it, other than they hate seeing me send them a text. Um, and I, I want to jump back to what Stacy said. She was talking about how comfortable she was getting through the material, and she's too modest to talk about some of the writing that she's done. But uh, I mean, teaching an AP subject, Stacy's—I've read a lot of Stacy's blog posts about how much more comfortable her students are covering a huge amount of AP content material as well. So I think that that that, that road kind of cuts both ways. It, it, it's you know more more relaxed for her, but more relaxed for kids who are in a high stress environment in a high stress class. Thanks. <laughs> okay, then um, I think I've kept you probably long enough uh, for your day. Um, I, I'll go back to the room to make sure there's nothing else that we uh, want to ask or anything on the list that's there. Tracy, go ahead. Are any of you guys using students to create videos? Uh, well, I was thinking, are you talking about for lessons? My students create a lot of video. Uh, videos for assignments, like video lab. Yeah, do you use them to create the, the lessons? I've been thinking about doing that, actually. I haven't taken the jump yet. I do. I, um, I use paper slide videos. We'll, we'll throw a, con a concept out there. I won't really talk about it. They'll have to go get the information. Throw it on a couple pieces of paper slide and uh, dump it back to me within about two days. And I tend to get good stuff that work in groups, so... I use it a lot for um, reviewing when, when we get to kind of um, synthesizing the material and then kind of getting ready for a test review or an exam review. I do a lot of them making the video and then us putting them all together. And also, it's awesome in AP Calculus. I now have like a bank of old free response videos, and so I don't have to teach how to how the scoring guidelines go for the AP or how um, how to prep yourself to take the AP problems. Those are all done by kids in the past, and then when we get to AP review prep this year, we'll make new videos. So. Yeah, I've I've also had students do it for review, much like much like Stacy has. They've they've collaborative collaborative collaboratively worked on presentations or or videos. Um, just to review before a test. Um, 
Um, Eric Marcos does a whole ton of student created videos. I think the the website is mathtrain.tv, um, and there's a, a huge bank of of student created content there. Cool. Awesome. Well, uh, I would just like to formally say thank you uh, for your time, uh, your attention, your professionalism. I think this is just uh, a really cool way to rethink how we are. Uh, working on professional learning and, and collaborating across the United States from East Coast to West Coast to the uh, beautiful mountains of Colorado. Uh, so this is pretty cool. So uh, thank you guys for your time um, and uh, just be in touch on Twitter, Facebook, Google Plus, all that other stuff. All right. Thanks for having us. Good to chat with you. Yeah, thanks. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Appreciate it. Bye.